Only the most curious and persistent people thrive in offensive security. How do I become a better hacker? How can I build and maintain my advantage over adversaries? And what's limiting my ability to think creatively? This podcast is for you if you're the kind who's always digging deeper for answers. Join me as I talk to some of the world's best offensive security pros about their work ethic, thinking, and real-world experiences. This is We Think We Know, a podcast from Pentestools.com. Sometimes penetration testing gets boxed into a narrow, shallow definition, which is neither real nor fair to you, the person doing this type of challenging work. To deliver meaningful results as a pen tester, you have to be both patient and persistent. You need to both love the process and strive for results, and you need to go in depth, but also cultivate a broad understanding of the elements at play. It's a fine balancing act. It's a craft. It is an art form. And today, we're lucky to have a guest that not only proves this through her work, but also teaches it to others through her role as a manager and community leader. Willa Riggins talks about how every small piece contributes to the larger picture in pen testing and explains why it's about understanding the intricacies and appreciating the craftsmanship. Examples from her over 15 years of hands-on experience across application development, offensive security, and management highlight the fundamental role of people. The people who make technology, the people who test it security, and the companies that keep it safe to use. From the mindset behind excellent pen testing work to the things that are never going to change in this space, we go through Willa's experiences, hard-earned know-how, and thoughtful approach. This conversation is a treat, and it is a privilege to share it with you. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you today, and I'm so grateful to have this opportunity um, because you are uh, such not just a super generous and supportive person of other people, but you bring such wonderful experience from almost every angle imaginable in this space. Uh, and I cannot wait to unpack your stories for people to learn from. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much and, and no pressure <laughs> on me. Um, I am glad that uh, a good reputation precedes me at least. Well, absolutely. And it is me who I uh, feel the pressure in the sense of uh, trying to do right by by your knowledge and your experience and your thoughtful insights. And something that I wanted to actually start with, you've, you have a lot of experience behind you as an individual contributor, but also as a manager for like a large team handling really complex projects. And you have this this great big picture view that gives you insight not into just how you do work individually but how that dynamic um, changes and evolves over time so i was wondering you know what realities of the job did you bump into when you started in pen testing and how have they changed over the last 10 years Oh gosh, that's a that's a big question. I, I think you know early on when I started, um, I think every pen tester goes through this. It's it's the excitement of the job. You know, you think every day is going to be you know hack all the things, and get all the shells, and you know exfil all the data, and it, it's not like that at all. Um, I think I was explaining to one of my direct reports the other day. It's a lot of what we do is research and try, research and try, and nine times out of ten, what we're trying is not going to work. Um, so it's a lot of kind of um, trying to solve a puzzle that might not have a solution. Um, and I always coach folks who are trying to go into the industry that, you know, if you like solving problems, you might like this job, but you also have to like solving problems that might not have an answer. Um, sometimes the answer is that there's, there's just not a flaw here. There's nothing to find. Um, and that can be really difficult, especially if you're doing that every day, day in and day out. Uh, that imposter syndrome, that kind of... Um, you know, <laughs> that uh, that lack of dopamine from finding the thing um, can happen really easily. Uh, but also, you know, there's more to the job than just finding flaws. Sometimes that means writing a report. And sometimes when you deliver that report, you have to explain what you found. And there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, 
talking about empathy and and you know working with stakeholders and developers and whoever it is that's receiving that finding to explain why this is important. So there's a lot of storytelling in it as well. Um, but just there's a lot of different dimensions of what we call penetration testing and pen testing and red teaming and all those different pieces um, that really make up the job. It's not just having really good skills. It's also being able to translate those into what a business needs. It really is. That's And I love that this is a topic that's getting more attention and more intention from people in this industry because they see how it makes a difference. And they see that when we, the people we look up to in the industry actually have spent time developing these particular skills and they've not only helped elevate the community by itself, but it also benefited their careers, of course, which is obviously what we want people to, to experience in their, um, you know, in their lifetime. And talking like a building on, on this particular idea of this is something that's always been important and will most likely continue to be extremely important, no matter how fancy and smart tools get. Uh, because there are so many other aspects that tool cannot, tools cannot even begin to cover. What drove you at those when you were kind of, you know, facing the challenges that people in your team face today? What kept you going? What kind of fueled you in, in for when that lack of dopamine, when those repetitive things started to kick in and started to be a bit disconcerting? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of it is kind of um, retuning your brain to think in terms of um, hey, we're not just proving negatives. We also want to talk about positives. We want to talk about what teams are doing well. So when we don't find, you know, cross-site scripting in a web application across the entire application, what did they do right? What did what did they do to mitigate that vulnerability? Um, same with SQL injection, all the different OWASP top tens. You know, what what is that team doing right? Or maybe it's a process thing. You know, maybe we were doing, you know, social engineering, maybe we were doing some kind of other activity that they were able to prevent that through process, or maybe their people are just really good at spotting things. Um, it's good to call those out and not just look at, you know, this is what I found on my test. These are the things you're doing wrong. This is how I think you can improve. Uh, we also need to talk about what are they doing right? What are the things that are different? Uh, but also, you know, understanding and being self-aware that, you know, I'm not always going to find every finding. Um, you know, it, it's we're human. That's what we do. Uh, every person's different. Every person's going to find different findings. Um, you know, it's a, we, we like to call it a, that when I was in consulting, it's like it's a point in time assessment done by a human being. Uh, we're not going to find everything. It doesn't it's not an exhaustive test. Um, as much as we'll try to be comprehensive, every pen test is time boxed. Um, you know, if we had unlimited time and unlimited labor on a pen test, that would be awesome. We'd probably find so many more things. Um, but I think it's really learning that. And you learn that kind of through, you know, doing the job for a while and learning that, oh, this is what this is like. This is what it feels like when I think I've done enough. This is what it feels like when I've done a good job. Um, and kind of building that self-confidence and that knowledge that, you know, I've covered all the bases, I've done all the things I think I need to do, there will still be mistakes and that's okay. I, I think that's the big piece is, and it really comes with seniority and kind of having spent time on keyboard and really doing the work. It absolutely does. And thank you for highlighting that expectation of a, an ideal scenario where you'd have all of the time and all of the resources, all of the things. Uh, when that never happens yeah. <laughs> and uh, that would produce all of the findings, but who would take care of them? Because you'd yeah. need to have a lot of resources to actually tackle all of those findings and, and, you know, make them happen and apply or the remediation and, you know, follow all the guidance. And I was wondering if you have from your previous experience while working on application security or even like further back. Uh, when you were working in app development and and you know doing uh, sysadmin stuff, like what what did it feel like when you were and on the receiving end of pen testing findings, and what that experience taught you or how it served you when you actually became a pen tester? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, you know, unfortunately, my development career started really early uh, before application security really took off. Um, so really, 
my kind of first experience with application security was being on the other side. So switching sides from being a developer to then, you know, giving all the insider knowledge on how bad the code base was to our, our leadership and helping develop the first application security program at that company. Um, but what I kind of learned is the, you know, generally developers want to do the right thing. Um, you know, we all want to have perfect code. We don't want to have vulnerabilities. Um, nobody's looking to do that. Um, but the challenges are really in, you know, what we mentioned earlier was resources. You know, do I have the time and the money to go and fix these vulnerabilities? Because I want to. I, I want to have, you know, impenetrable code. I want to have, you know, the best application I possibly can. But can I afford to do that? Um, and that's what I learned early in my career is very much that, you know, everybody wants to do the right thing, but they're not always able to. Um, and now in my current role, kind of learning what risk management looks like, you know, how do we decide what to fix and what is okay, or what can we mitigate in another way? Um, and that's really kind of taught me that, um, you know, even though everyone wants to do the right thing, we can't do all of them. Um, so let's take a risk-based approach to where we spend our time and our money, both on the, you know, the pen testing side to find flaws, but also on the risk remediation side. Um, you know, we're not going to spend the same amount of time fixing a low as we would, you know, maybe a critical or high. Um, but, you know, it's important to kind of align those resources where we think they're going to do the most good. And that is such a, an important aspect of the craft and such a deeply human kind of ability to be able to take all of that context information, tie it to the business context, understand where it makes sense, understand what makes sense specifically for that business in that sector with those particular compliance uh, restraints and so on and so forth. There's just so much that goes into making these decisions. Um, and has this decision-making process changed what you um, expect of the pen testers that you manage? You know, I, I think kind of. Um, I, I like to think of it in kind of two different parts of how we measure, um, you know, risk and impact. One is kind of our technical risk. This is in a vacuum without all the modifiers for what industry if we're in, what our compliance needs are. What is that finding in a vacuum? You know, the CVSS score of, you know, a CVE that's out on the internet. What is, what is that score? What does it mean? And then kind of taking that and looking at what we call a residual risk. What does it look like for us? Um, and that can be very different. You know, maybe there's mitigating factors like, you know, network security, firewalls, detections, um, you know, web application firewalls. What, what are those mitigating technologies? And then, you know, is it on the perimeter? Is it all on the internet? Or is it just an internal application? Or uh, who uses it? How many users are on it? What data does it process? All those different things kind of then modify that residual risk down to understand where does it actually land for us? What's most important? So I think my ask of my, my testers is keep reporting all the things. You know, don't let the environment affect how you feel about a vulnerability. Do your best to be objective to measure it in a vacuum and then apply kind of what the business thinks about that vulnerability. And we work really closely with our stakeholders and product security as well to kind of calibrate some of those because we don't always know that. As pen testers, you know, we're not experts on every domain and every business unit in a company. We only know what we are given and what we, we know from our experience and being there. So oftentimes partnering with other parts of an organization or even, you know, in a consulting environment, partnering with the customer to understand what are your needs and where, what makes the most sense for you. Um, but I, I think my ask of testers is just, you know, keep doing what you do and do it well. Um, because, you know, we, we get into this kind of, um, I, you know, we don't want to commoditize pen testing. We don't want to make it where it's just, we're checking a box. We want to continue to do the high level, you know, in-depth work that we're supposed to do um, as part of our craft. I love that. I love that. And that distinction is so, so helpful because yes, there is this like more senior people in the space are definitely trying to help younger pen testers develop that ability to think in context, to connect things to the business needs, to be able to walk business people and decision makers with less of a technical background through their report in a way that makes sense for them and that persuades them to make all of these decisions. 
but how you build that argument for yourself and what that process looks like on, on your end of things can be different to this. So they don't have to necessarily come together. They can come at different stages. So thank you for making that distinction. And I was wondering if we might look at like a quick example, because at a quick example of a particular vulnerability, we can pick any any of them because the apocalypse seems sure. to come like twice a month in penetration <laughs> testing. Um, so for a situation like log for shelf, for instance, what does that look like from, from your perspective as a manager uh, leading a team of penetration testers and having to cope with this kind of vulnerability that everyone's raging about? Like, what do you do first? How do you approach that in a way that's mindful of all of the things that we've talked about so far? Sure. I, I think one of the biggest things for us is really um, confirming exploitation because we have folks in application security and across like uh, our development teams who can look at kind of the um, composition of an application, tell you if log for shell is, is you know, going to impact their application. But what they can't tell you is, can you exploit it? Um, and I think that's uh, really where pen testing comes in and really uh, adds a lot of value there is to say, hey, you know, we know this is out on the perimeter. It's going to take us X number of days to fix. You know, can you exploit it? Is this something we need to escalate? Do we need to do it today? Um, and so, you know, that's where my team will come in and kind of do their poking and prodding and see just how hard is it to exploit this, um, to hopefully give our defenders a little bit more data to work on so they can prioritize. Because at that point, every log for shell engines is, is important, right? Everything is urgent. It's critical. We got to fix it right now. So how do you kind of split hairs? Where do we start? Uh, fixing things? Where where should we go first? And so that's where my team generally kind of helps out with things like log for shell is to say, you know, yes, we can exploit this. This is how easy it is. You know, here's a POC that you can use to uh, test your remediations or your detections, and, you know, if that's the way that we're going as well. Um, but really our part is to help our defenders, help our developers to, you know, get to a remediated state. Uh, whether that's, you know, testing what they fixed to see, hey, did your fix work? Or, um, you know, testing for exploitation to tell our defenders, you know, one, do your detections work? And two, um, you know, how easy is this? So that we can kind of feed that into whether it's a CVSS score or the vulnerability management system in some other way. Um, and that's really kind of where uh, my team has helped out a lot with things like that, uh, any kind of zero day situations. Because prioritization seems to be not, not just a keyword for our work but for our lives in general yeah. <laughs> i feel like penetration testing itself makes you so mindful of let's say constraints and of limited time and what you can achieve in that time and using constraints actually makes us more creative uh that's like a documented fact and many people use this to their advantage uh, while cramming to study for a university exam, <laughs> mine, uh, among other things. But that that practice itself, I feel it's such a um, test of maturity because as you evolve, you get better at spotting these things. You get better at developing patterns and processes and mindset and uh, ways to approach things. But what particularly stands out about how you talk about these things is that you seem to have helped your team cultivate a very good relationship with developers and other teams in the company. And I was wondering, were there any particular things that you did in this direction to make sure that communication is smooth and make sure that people are working together and it doesn't feel like an adversarial relationship where pen testers are finger pointing uh, and making the dual developers and defenders feel less ideal about themselves you know I'll, I'll say up front it's a work in progress um I, I think any offensive security team is going to struggle with that same problem um i think you know what my team has done in the last couple of years is really try to meet developers where they are um you know so first off you know when we report findings we have a readout you know most consultants do that too but when we have our readouts we really want to discuss you know the vulnerability does it impact it who owns it you know, is it the development team? 
do they own the infrastructure that we're reporting the vulnerability against or is it an application vulnerability so first kind of understanding ownership so that we're not catching them off guard because if it's something they can't fix we're not really enabling them to go and, and resolve the issue um, and then second you know explaining things to them so we have uh, twice a week my team does office hours and that's really to allow developers to drop in and ask questions so if they get a report and they're like i don't understand where this problem is or i don't understand how to fix this they can drop into our office hours have a question and we partner with our product security team as well so if they have you know detailed remediation needs that are very specific to their application they can ask those folks too and that really enables that kind of two-way communication that is um, less kind of ad hoc because you know we're used to getting emails and instant messages and all those different things and it's really hard for a team to stay focused um, during that both for the developers and for the pen test team so we've kind of funneled that um, activity into those office hours and also kind of a shared mailbox but the idea is really to give them access to someone whoever it is on the team at any given time so that when they ask a question they get a prompt answer um, and that's that's really helped i think um, the other thing we've done is um, we all know about you know when you write your pen test report you publish your findings uh, those folks have you know x number of days to go fix them um, and so our, you know our organization decided hey we're going to lower that we're going to lower that that threshold and try to get those to fix faster but then as a pen test team we can't take longer to do our assessments and do our retesting we have to lower that as well so we actually lowered our retesting uh, turnaround time significantly um, to allow the developers more time to spend on their remediations um, and that's that's really helped kind of build that culture of we're in this together i think kind of our next step the thing that we're looking to do um, going forward is to really integrate with their sdlc process um, you know working with them to integrate into their agile pipelines you know, really kind of work inside their project so that they can plan for the pen test as part of their work, as part of their validation. So it's not a surprise because uh, a lot of these teams get caught off guard. They, they have to do yep. their compliance testing every year and every year it's still a surprise because they don't know when it's going to happen and we're not, you know, working closely enough with the people doing the work to, you know, really make an impact there. And so that's something we're doing kind of going forward. But again, always a work in progress. Um, you know, a lot of um, folks look at pen testing as a compliance function, and I think that kind of downplays what we really do. Um, you know, this is very creative work, very, um, you know, sideways thinking. And, you know, sometimes we find things that, um, you know, they're not compliance related, but they are incredibly important. Uh, maybe it's, you know, business logic, exploiting a process flow, something like that. But, you know, trying to retrain folks that we're not just a compliance function we're here to help you you know do the best that you, you know make the best applications and the best uh, infrastructure that you can uh thank you for sharing that's that's such a thoughtful approach and thank you for sharing the details of that i feel like that's very generous and helpful for other people to understand how these things can happen and how small changes can start improving those those relationships that at the end of the day that's Absolutely. what makes a company work that's what keeps a company safe uh tools <clears throat> tools and processes may be nice, uh, but without those relationship to actually make them happen, that's just going to be nice words on a piece of, uh, well, I wanted to say paper, but <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> thankfully, we've yeah. uh, discarded some of that. Um, that um, you you talked a lot about some, some aspects that I feel are so important because pet testing does get boxed in into this very narrow, sometimes superficial definition that becomes frustrating to the people who do this work because their work gets misinterpreted and mislabeled and honestly not appreciated. So when you see someone come around and claim that that can automate your work on top of all of these things that already make you feel like I'm not getting enough recognition, I'm not being seen or valued um, according to the work that I do. And then this comes along, oof, that can really like hit a nerve. So I was wondering, how do you talk about automation in your team? Like, how do you relate to it? And how do you obviously use it to make your work better, but without having this uh, generalization that honestly helps no one and is unrealistic as well? Yeah, I really think when we talk about automation, we have to kind of frame what that means. 
um, because a lot of uh, vendors and companies with that silver bullet automation are looking to replace the human. Um, I don't think that's the path forward. I, I think data fusion, you know, looking at how do we use automation to help our people make better decisions, that's where we need to spend the time. You know, and we're using that today. When you look at products like Burp Suite, you know, Burp Suite tells you, hey, I think there's a vulnerability here. Uh, it, it can't tell you definitively, but it'll say, hey, I think there's a cross-site scripting attack here, or hey, I think there's a SQL injection here, or um, you know, this library might be vulnerable. But it really takes a human being to kind of put that together, chain those vulnerabilities together into you know, an exploit path, an attack path. And I think that's where really the value out of automation is. Um, but when we think about it a little more broadly, I, I mean, a lot of companies are doing static code analysis, they're doing dynamic analysis, um, they have a lot of data. Um, and so building those feedback loops to take some of that data and take a look at it and help the pen testers kind of target where they're going to spend their time. Because if we have a lot of, you know, um, cross-site scripting or SQL injection, maybe we can do something with that. Or maybe we need to spend more time on the business logic because those app, you know, those different tools don't cover that. They don't have that insight. Um, and I think that's really how we need to frame automation is it's more of kind of giving the human the data that they need to make better decisions versus replacing them entirely. Um, and while I do think there might be some time savings, I don't think it's, it's, it's as much as people think it is. I really don't. Um, I know a lot of companies will sell kind of a, oh, we'll do a scan and a test. And I say, well, what, what is that percentage? And a lot of places will tell you, you know, well, it's 80-20, uh, you know, 80% manual, 20% uh, hands-on or, or scanning. And, you know, trying to work through that and really understand what does that mean, um, I think kind of is extremely limiting for testers. Uh, because a lot of the tools that we use, a lot of the things that we use to do our job are automation. Um, but what puts it together is a human being. Oh, that's absolutely, you framed it beautifully. Uh, I feel like you brought such clarity to a topic that gets so murky, depending on whose interests are at stake. But in the end of the day, I feel like respecting each other's um, insights and experience and contribution is the most important thing that gets us to learn the most, that gets us to create things that are actually valuable, whether it's technology or processes or training or whatever it is and to actually stay firmly rooted into the reality of things instead of trying to portray, um, which we sometimes do in this industry, the space is such an obscure, um, yeah. very like a very cyberpunk vibe kind of thing. Uh, and then people come into the industry for the hype of it and they might be slightly disappointed about it, sometimes mundane reality of things, of getting things done in this space. Yeah. So I really, really appreciate uh, you bringing such a, a, a mature and uh, such a balanced approach to, to this space. And speaking about targeting your time, um, especially when it comes to learning versus doing, exploring all of these things, there's such a vast amount of possibility in this space. How do you help the people on your team and the people who you mentor um, find a way to combine focus with also having the flexibility to explore things? Because that is definitely one of the biggest challenges that I've seen everyone struggle with, including myself, although I don't have necessarily a technical profile, but the learning, of course, never ends uh, in either in either direction as well. So how do you help them with insights from, from your experience of doing the same? Sure. I mean, I, I think I, I'm fortunate I have a great team. Um, they're all continuous learners. They all want to keep doing what they do. Um, and that that's really helpful is to build the right team. Obviously, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You don't always get to know who people are before you hire them. Um, but been very fortunate there. I think what I've done, you know, as a leader is try to make time for that, to set aside the time for that continuous learning. Because, you know, if, if we don't learn on the job, we're, you know, it's, we're never going to keep up with the industry. So um, we've built a culture where, you know, continuous learning is encouraged and we make time for it during working hours. Um, you know, we have, I think, two half days every other week where we spend some time kind of, uh, I guess you call it sharpening the saw and really working together and understanding. We do CTFs together as a team. Uh, every once in a while, I'll even 
try to participate. Um, it's been a while since I've been hands on keyboard, but um, you know, still got a little bit of chops uh, here and there. But really sharing knowledge uh, across the team, um, you know, without looking at titles, we just all kind of pitch in and, and look at what everyone's doing um, and share. Um, and that's really kind of how we do things on my team is just um, you know being intentional about spending time to learn. Um, but also, you know, on our tests, when we were doing our, our penetration testing, you know, we also earmark things for this needs more research. Um, obviously, you know, like I said before, we can't spend all the time in the world on one engagement, but we can kind of say, this is interesting. I wonder if this is anywhere else. Um, and kind of make a note of that to go look for that or pass it off to our application security team to, you know, hey, maybe you need to dig a little deeper on this one. Um, and, and that's kind of how we, we manage that uh, on my current team. Um, but, you know, also encouraging folks to submit to conferences, to do presentations, to talk about their work, I think is really important. You know, um, I've got a few individuals who are trying to get their first conference, uh, you know, their first uh, talk accepted and to get on stage and you know, I've been a CFP reviewer I know what that's like so I can kind of coach them on that but really it's just sharing knowledge freely um, and kind of you know I guess that's the hacker mentality <laughs> you know information wants yes. to be free and that's kind of how we are um, we, we share pretty much everything um, and there's been quite a few times when folks on my team have taught me a new thing uh, which is awesome um, but yeah hopefully that answers the question I appreciate it being so supportive and getting people to put themselves out there, especially because it is not easy, especially when you look at the industry and you look at all of the people who've been in it for decades with such incredible research and experience and you feel like imposter syndrome not only creeps up, but it starts really shouting at the back of your head, just saying like, no, there's no point in doing this and just making that first step and seeing someone acknowledge and appreciate your work that makes huge, huge difference. Uh, and I love that you're inspiring people to do the same. And how about you? How does that kind of setting time apart to learn? To, how do you balance management with keeping your knowledge up to date, with making sure that your health and stays uh, as well as, you know, as well like, <laughs> uh, sustained as, as it can be? How do you find time for all of these things because uh, as we progress through all of these stages in our careers those things really change and sometimes they can get quite quite challenging yeah i mean i'll be honest um it is difficult to balance uh, especially you know I, i've got a pretty large team um but what i like to do is kind of uh, help out folks so like we're, we're doing a ctf team for uh wicked six this year with a few of the other ladies uh, in the company and um you know getting to participate with them and kind of sit with them and see how they learn and to also kind of coach and help. Um, that's been awesome. Uh, but also letting them watch me make mistakes. <laughs> so, um, Cause it's, it's very humbling when you're, you know, on the command line and you're like, I can't remember what this command is. Um, and then, you know, you work together with other folks to get there. Um, but also, you know, finding time to, to volunteer, uh, to help out with CFP review for those smaller conferences and, you know, different, um, areas of information security and staying involved with the community is huge uh especially for me because um it's a really small industry and everybody knows each other so um it's great to stay connected and it also helps you kind of learn what's new in the space you know what are people working on what are people learning about right now um and that that really helps me to uh, but also you know finding a hobby outside of security i think is one of those things that's really overlooked especially in kind of newer folks you need something outside of your job um for me it's you know going out and taking pictures of birds and, and things like that um but that's you know just finding something to get you away from the desk so that you can clear your mind and then come back fresh um because i think a lot of um you know, what we do is, as offensive security practitioners, we spend a lot of time banging our head against the wall, uh, trying to figure out what is the next finding I'm going to get. So walking away for a little bit can be really, you know, it's counterintuitive, but it can actually make you more productive. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. It absolutely is. I can totally attest to that. I think everyone can, especially because sometimes we learn about this particular aspect the hard way. 
and we wish other people wouldn't have to go through the same experience, wouldn't have to put their health at risk uh, to figure this out and to actually start practicing it. So um, the least we can do is talk to others about it and uh, also try to uh, use our own examples, try to walk that talk and, and actually show people that you can still grow in a career without making it your only thing. Um, and that that's a perfectly normal and healthy way to do it, especially. We talked about many of the aspects that go into this mindset that shapes excellence uh, and it shapes meaningful work in this space. Uh, the things that make it a craft and not a commodity. What do you think are some stereotypes that you see people perhaps not question as much as they should? Uh, and how have you seen like harm? How have you seen them harm people on their way to you know developing their careers, developing their skills, but especially developing the mindset and the motivation behind them behind it all? Sure, I think that's really a difficult question. I, I think a lot of folks coming into the industry think that there's you know one skill they need to learn um you know like whether it's learning how to use a command line learning how to do web application you know testing whether it's you know learning how to use nmaps they can do network testing um it's not and that's really hard especially starting out in the industry to figure out how do i learn all these things there's just so much and i, I think people think they need to absorb all of it all the time all at once but really what kind of makes the magic is having other people who know things too. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, when I worked on Red Team um, many, many years ago, um, you know, I was the web application person. I, I did a lot of that pen test work, but we also had someone who did infrastructure and someone who did database and someone who understood OSINT. And working together, we all learned those different things, but not at the same level. Um, and that really helped me grow and helped, you know, broaden my skill set. Uh, but I still kept my depth in web application security. Um, and I think that, um, you know, early on in your career, understanding that you can't know everything and you're not supposed to, um, you know, people make mistakes. People are going to type nmap-h all the time. They're going to look at the help documentation. They're going to look at the man pages. You know, you're going to have to just kind of learn and grow as you do it more and more. Um, I think that's one thing, you know, because I, I see a lot of folks that are starting out. I try to kind of help where I can, but um, thankfully there's a lot of really great training out there to help folks get into the industry, but I don't think it fully covers you know, the full gamut of things you need to understand. Um, and that's kind of one piece. I think the other two is, you know, some people view pen test as a checkbox activity. They think there's some algorithm that they can do and a process they can follow. Uh, you know, they read the the pen test execution standard. And they think, oh, if I follow these steps, I can do a pen test. Um, and that's not really how it works. Um, it's, I had a manager a few years ago who um, he would draw out a diagram of what it looks like to follow the steps of, of the pen test execution standard. And basically, it was a bunch of arrows leading back to starting all over again. Um, and it was... You're going to do all these steps all the time, but you're never going to do them in the same order. And sometimes you're going to jump back. Um, and, you know, it really kind of shows you how much of an art pen testing can be because you have to make that decision as a human being. OK, this isn't, you know, maybe this application doesn't have an Active Directory connection, so I don't need to test for Active Directory. Or maybe this application doesn't have a login. You know, maybe it's a marketing site or something. I don't need to test for login enumeration. I don't need to test for X, Y, Z. And so kind of tailoring that methodology and understanding when to back up and then when to go deeper um, is also one of those things I think a lot of people struggle with because it's not, um, it's not a process you can follow. There's no checklist. Um, as much as some folks may try to implement checklists for pen tests, like sometimes the vulnerability is not on the list. Sometimes it's not in the OWASP top 10. Sometimes it's something weird, <laughs> you know, um, completely out of left field that you have to write it up. And I, I think that's the other thing that I see a lot of um, kind of newer folks struggle with early on in their career is that, you know, everything's going to make sense. It, it's not. Um, so, Yeah. Such a good metaphor for life, pen testing, isn't it? It's never, it's never <laughs> a straight, it's never a straight path. You don't get, there is no recipe. You barely get any instructions. A lot of things are complicated, but you're still gonna figure your way 
through it, you're going to yeah. learn a lot of stuff. You're going to meet a bunch of great people. You're going to learn a lot about yourself too. I feel like self-development and just maturing as a person has a fundamental influence on how we do our work and how we contribute to our community, why we do all of these things and what we get um, out of it, like how, what kind of, you know, needs are met through all of these experiences and keeping that cycle going and going all over again. I feel like that's, that's the beauty of, of it at the end of the day. So thank you for, for reminding uh, us of that. And thank you for highlighting the underrated value of teamwork. Uh, I feel like sometimes penetration testing uh, can attract a lot of people who like to work on their own, which is not a bad thing, but we can only learn and progress um, through working with others, through collaboration. We cannot work in a vacuum. It's never going to happen. We wouldn't have jobs if we <laughs> would have to work in a vacuum. Honestly speaking, uh, there wouldn't be things to fix <laughs> if we'd all just be doing it on our own, trying to figure it all out. Um, I really appreciate everything that you shared with us so far. And I was wondering if, if we might touch on, let's say, things that you think will continue to be just as important going forward because people tend to get attracted a lot about the new shiny thing, the new technology, the new tool, uh, the new methodology, the new cheat sheet, so many things that are attention grabbing in the space as well. But sometimes focusing on the things that don't change can turn out to be something that's really invaluable. So what are some of those things that you've seen in your career so far uh, that require attention and that are still and of largely unsolved issues. Sure. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of what I see in the industry boils down to having a threat model. Um, because we see a lot of new development, whether it's AI, whether it's, you know, microservices or uh, a new cloud or, you know, whatever it happens to be. But I think a lot of folks forget to go back to basics and say, all right, where are the key components? Where are my crown jewels? what are the threats and you know potential vulnerabilities in this architecture you know how do i look at this from a more holistic standpoint bring people to the table to ask okay what do you think could go wrong uh, and i think there's a tremendous amount of value there um because we can't anticipate how these new systems are going to work we don't know you know how they function what the exploits are going to be but we do know what could go wrong um i, I think as humans we can we can make that assertion um, you know, whether it's bias in AI or if it's buffer overflows and prompts or whatever it happens to be, like, we can think about that uh, without kind of focusing on the underlying technology. We can at least think about, um, you know, those abuse cases. Because um, I think what's going to become more and more important in pen testing is kind of differentiating between that commodity level checkbox testing and that more human, more in-depth, you know, craftsmanship that is penetration testing. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to see a lot more focus on kind of abuse cases. Uh, how do we, you know, exploit a control? You know, how do we get past this firewall? How do we get past this web application firewall? I think there's still going to be an emphasis on, you know, code vulnerabilities. Absolutely. I don't think those are going away. Uh, I think we're going to see them in new creative ways, but I think, you know, all of the basics are still going to be important. Um, you know, whether that's the OWASP top 10 or the, the CWB 25, whatever it happens to be, like all those things are still important. Um, and we're just going to see them in new and creative ways. But thinking about those threats instead of kind of tying it to individual technologies, I think is going to enable more people to bring more to the table. Um, but yeah, I, I think everything that is old is new again <laughs> every time we go through one of these cycles. Um, but also, you know, the threats don't change. Like the threats are still there. You know, when we talk about um, web applications, like we're still looking at access control. We're still looking at authorization and authentication. Um, you know, when we look at AI, we're still looking at, um, you know, what is the input and output that's processed? You know, do we trust user input? Um, what could possibly go wrong? And that's, I think those things are never going to change. That is absolutely true. And if you, we look back at decades, 
even in human history, there are analogies and examples of this in real life that have continued to be problems simply because that's human nature to try to exploit things. It's all tied to human nature at the end of the day because we make technology, we shape it, we use it uh, for the worse or for the better. And that's uh, going to remain a constant in society for um, at least the foreseeable future <laughs> for, for as far as we can peer into it. Um, thank you for, for highlighting this. And this, this kind of reminds me of why it's so helpful to step outside of the office, whether at home or an actual office building, and to go to conferences, to talk to people, to have those conversations uh, over a, a drink, whether it's water or something else, uh, and to just spend time thinking about things and debating them with other people instead of just Google or <laughs> another search engine or just yourself. Just getting outside of our heads in general feels increasingly important, not that it's um, not always been, but increasingly so nowadays. Um, so we've gone over the bunch of things that, that get us excited into this field and that uh, are thought provoking and that deserve our time, attention, and and intention. But I'm really curious of um, what's what's something that you love to tinker with right now. What's something that gets you excited and gives you that um, you know feeling of ah, this is so new, and this gives me so much energy and curiosity. I want to spend more time on it. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I've got a few of those. I think right now, like we're preparing for that CTF uh, later this year, and that's been really fun because it scratches an itch that I, I don't get to get hands on keyboard much anymore. So it's been really nice to, to get back into it and kind of see, you know, knock the rust off of some of those skills, but also to see the, the looks on other people's faces when they get their first, you know, exploit, you know, when they get their first time. And, and that's, that's been awesome to see, um, but also just playing with hardware. Um, you know, I, I have a bunch of uh, components behind me. Uh, I'm actually building some uh, full body trackers for VR. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to kind of get your hands on the hardware again um, and to tinker and solder and program and, and do all those different things. Uh, but also, like I said, you know, having something outside the office, uh, something outside of technology, uh, just, you know, going, doing bird photography, birding um, has been a blast. So, um, it really kind of scratches that itch of, um, you know, if you've ever watched Pokemon <laughs> trying to catch them all, it's like that, but they're real. Um, and it's a lot of fun trying to get that next uh, photograph, uh, especially, you know, here in uh, Chicago, it's, it's very cold. So um, it, it's been a different challenge, but um, I think that's the mix really is, you know, looking at kind of offensive security and spending a little bit of time there to, you know, make sure I'm still plugged in both with my team, but also with the industry to make sure that I can still keep up, um, you know, at least when we're talking about what we're doing, uh, especially when you go to cons and things like that, you want to be able to have you know, something to talk about too. Uh, but then also, you know, having something hands-on to tinker with, to build um, something to make, I think is really important for me, at least to have something to create and to drive. Uh, and then also having something that takes you outside. I, I think that's huge. It really is. And thank you for, for sharing so uh, deeply and so honestly with us all of these aspects of your work and of your life. I feel like that's such a rich experience that we can all learn from and that connects something or, or something within us that we need. Uh, I feel like whenever we listen to a conversation or when I listen to a conversation or a podcast or have a conversation with someone else, there are things that it kind of bubble up. Uh, for me and something tells me that that needs a bit more attention that's something worth looking into just like you mentioned you were mentioning earlier thank you so much for this it's been just so exciting and and so um motivating and, and inspiring as much as this word gets thrown around but it is so so true it feels so true and so real thank you for being here and uh for doing everything that you do for the community it's it's something that really echoes uh, much further than it may seem. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Ever wondered how deep the rabbit hole goes in the world of ethical hacking? Well, we're still falling and we're dragging you along with us one question at a time. 
Thanks for wandering through this maze with us as we tackle the nitty gritty, flip misconceptions on their heads, and maybe, just maybe, made you rethink some of the things that are important to you. This has been the We Think We Know podcast by pentestools.com. And before I sign off, keep this in mind. There's always a back door or at the very least, a sneaky side entrance. See you next time.